Welcome to NASP Dialogues, the dialogue pos- podcast focused on events and issues in school psychology. I'm Rebecca Camizio, co-chair of NASP's Communication Committee and moderator of our current dialogue. Today we are discussing self-care with Dr. Paula Gill-Lopez. Dr. Lopez, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay, well, I, um, I actually... I began my undergrad at SUNY Purchase in New York, where I was born in Queens, so. Um, And then I left after two years and went to New York Tech for a year. And then I switched coasts and found myself in Southern California, in San Clemente, and I went to Saddleback College. I got my associate's degree in early childhood And then I finished up at Cal State Fullerton with my uh, BA in psychology. And then I moved up to the Bay Area where I got my doctorate, did my doctoral work at UC Berkeley in the school psychology program. Um, And I got my PhD there. And I was a school psychologist for a a little bit in um, Richmond, California, where I lived, where I bought my first house. Um, Go Oilers, Richmond High. And... um, and then I moved soon after I graduated to uh, Connecticut, and I'm a professor at Fairfield University, and I train school psychologists there. How do you define self-care? Well, I define self-care as the intentional, proactive pursuit of integrated wellness, personally and professionally balancing mind, body, and spirit. Um, and there's one caveat. And that is that one person's self-care should not come at the expense of another's. I have to put that on there because as school psychologists, we work in teams all the time. And sometimes we will have someone perhaps that is um, not thinking about the team and decides to go to Hawaii during PPT season. And um, that's not fair. Yes. (laughs) How did you become interested in self-care? Well, personally, my own journey as someone with um, ADHD, um, I had a, um, and, and a woman of faith, I, I prayed long and hard for, for God to give me peace, and for years and years I struggled, and I had to um, take medication, and, and I had a really hard time with two small children at home and as a working mom. And um, finally, I was led to a conference on mindfulness at Georgetown University. It was called the Hearts and Minds Conference, and my life was transformed after that. Um, So I started practicing mindfulness, and I was able to shed medication and get a handle on organization, time management, follow up, all those things, all those executive functioning skills that were tested. and I became much more um, present and aware in the moment. And um, as, as I, you know, I'm, I'm a director of a school psychology program at Fairfield Jews University. And um, as I began to see changes in the way I was able to function um, and the peace that had eluded me for so long was, was now within my grasp, um, I started thinking about my students and um, I have always been uh, interested in, in caring for the caregiver and that, and that piece. Um, so I became more and more interested in, in how I could proactively get caregivers to care for themselves. <laughs> how have you promoted self-care? Well, I think that um, by being a mindful um, practitioner. Um, as I mentioned, I have, um, I, I direct a school psychology program, so I believe that I, at least my students tell me <laughs> that I am um, sort of a model for um, calm, which was, o- which was always amazing for me to hear. <laughs> um, and that um, that sort of spills over into my classes and into my interactions with people. Um, As a pre-service, with my pre-service students, I 
have begun to infuse, well, about five or six years ago, I, I began to infuse mindfulness into my um, courses and into the program. Um, and also self-care, sort of really preaching self-care. Um, I came to that because um, I, I would have some of my alum contact me every so often and say, I don't know how I'm going to do this. This is really hard. You never told me it was going to be so stressful. And actually, I was at a prepare trainer, um, a prepare trainer, and I give workshops every other year for my students, and I invite my alum back. And out at a break during one prepare workshop, I had one of my alum come up to me and said, um, as you were defining crisis and trauma, I realized that my entire staff, my whole school is in crisis. And that to me um, was sort of a wake up call. And so more and more I became more deliberate in my promotion of self care within the, within the program. And then as people, my students were out there and, and people found out in the community and in school districts that I practiced mindfulness and self-care, I was asked and invited to do PDs on mindfulness and self-care. Um, at, you know, now I've done about 40 in the state of Connecticut over the last few years. So um, that's what I've done. And, and professionally, I've written about self-care in the communique, and I've written um, a couple of book chapters. So through all those means, I promote self-care every chance I get. Wow, those are wonderful, powerful examples. Um, who are your workshop participants? Well, initially, I was presenting to support people. So um, school psychologists, school counselors, school social workers. Um, then I would be asked to present to teachers. I presented to SPED teachers. I presented to um, therapeutic day staff. Um, at one of our cooperative educational services, as you know, in Connecticut, um, I present each year to the entire staff. So about 250 of their staff, um, really pointing them back to themselves and, and um, trying to raise their awareness that self-care is something that's very, very important to be doing, especially when you work with young children. Sure. What are the biggest takeaways from your professional development work with self-care? Well, um, my biggest takeaways, well, I, I have data that I've collected. Um, and I, the, when somebody asks me if I want to do, um, if I can do a self-care workshop, um, they'll ask me how much I charge. And I will say, you know, we can talk about that or I can collect data. And so I've been um, really blessed in having lots of data that I've collected now. And I have been really amazed because of the PDs and the naturalistic setting that I've collected the data in and the various configurations of, you know, sometimes I give two, three-hour workshops or sometimes I do it in an hour and a half or, you know, sometimes they're six weeks apart or, you know, usually my ideal is three workshops um, about four weeks apart, three hours each, but you know the ideal is is rare. So, but I have found really encouraging data, and my data has shown that um, between the pre and the post measures being taken, um, participants have uh, reported better self care, and that self care in professional, in the professional realm, as well as the physical, the psychological, and the spiritual realm. And um, interestingly, um, also better observing mindfulness, the different kinds of mindfulness, as well as um, better self-efficacy in terms of managing their classrooms or, or um, working with students in a more um, present, um, productive way. Um, so, so that's been really, that's been really great. Um, but then stepping back a little and just really kind of reflecting, which I do after all my workshops, um, I have taken away some 
when I first started, I was very interested in everyone having a product, and the product being a self-care plan that was balanced and it addressed all the different areas, personal and professional, mind, body, and spirit, and I had a little worksheet. And the more I gave the workshops, um, the more I realized that that wasn't realistic. And what I found was I was, I felt good if my participants work, walked away thinking, hmm, this is something I should be doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't really get most of my workshops. We don't get to the part where they have that. But just for people, because it's not something that people do for themselves. In our field, we have, um, you know, we're self-sacrificial. Self and we just give of ourselves to our own detriment. And just the idea that, um, you know, I should be taking care of myself. And I spend the beginning part of my workshop sort of trying to create three arguments for practicing self-care and giving people permission to practice self-care. And um, the first one is that um, it's ethically um, good practice. And in fact, if you don't practice self-care, it's unethical because as you know, practitioners, even across any discipline, the number one universal ethical principle is do no harm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't practice self-care, even as small as getting a good night's sleep or eating lunch mm -hmm. or you know, taking a break, there is the potential to do harm. You know, we could snap at a colleague or we could snap at a child that we're working with or as we're scoring tests, we might make a mistake because we're bleary-eyed and we can't really, um, we're not present enough to be scoring a protocol. So, so that's one way, I think. Um, the other way is that I think that um, in terms of um, ethics, we do have models in school counseling Whereas in school psychology, our ethics say you need to monitor yourself, and if there is, um, if you notice something out of whack, um, if you notice that you're slipping or you know you're not up to speed, you should take care of yourself. And I think in a in a profession that prides itself on prevention, and we talk a lot about prevention, that is um, a little after the fact. Mm -hmm. So I think we really need to do a proactive um, job of practicing self-care. And then one of the other things, Scott Hubner's work on burnout in school psychology um, and, and mental health professionals have a very high burnout rate. Um, and school psychologists, at least in one study, have the highest burnout rate. And I think that's because we deal with so many different people and people come to us, you know, pe people don't usually come to us to tell us how lovely we look or what the weather is like today. They come to us because they have problems, mm -hmm. right? And so that burnout rate um, and, and that coupled with the reports that I get from the field sometimes from students, um, we, we have a shortage area right now. We need people to stay in the field and we need to draw people into the field. And I think it's difficult to do that when you hear some of the stories from the field. Mm -hmm. um, so those two things. And then um, if that doesn't persuade people, um, the, the neuropsychological, um, physiological data on how a child's prefrontal cortex is developed, um, children's prefrontal cortex doesn't develop fully until like age 25, I think for some beyond that. And um, the way the prefrontal cortex is developed is through the unconscious attunement to the psychological and emotional states of the adults in their environment. So if we have a situation where we as the adults in children's environments are dysregulated or we're not pre presenting that calm presence, um, kids will attune to that. And in the same way that we, we know that some kids when they come in and we've met their parents um, and it all makes sense, 
<laughs> you know, and that's because those are the adults that they're attuning to. But as as school professionals being in the school with kids for six hours a day on a regular basis, we can make a dent and we can we can um, help them to develop a, a regulated a more regulated um, way of interacting with their environments. So I think um, those things are perhaps the most important um, elements of the workshop because as I find about a third of my participants say their biggest takeaway is that self-care is not selfish and that they really should be doing it so they just want to be given that permission and I think that that's you know I I try to give them lots of different techniques because self-care one size doesn't fit all mm -hmm. so I try to expose them to a lot of different ways to practice self-care and in my smaller workshops we will break into small groups and talk about you know what works for who and um, what kinds of things people are trying out and um, and so that really that's that's sort of like the second workshop but mm -hmm. the first workshop is really to get people to understand that um, that it is something that they should be doing for best practice um, I was just at a uh, session earlier and it was 20 years of school shootings what have we learned and I was really gratified to hear that the presenters um, really um, didn't just pay lip service but it was it was in several of their their talks they they mentioned self-care and how important it was and and if you know especially and going back to the student, the alumni who said, um, my, my staff is in crisis all the time, you know. And the mindfulness piece to the self-care helps us to stay at baseline and um, calms our amygdala. So again, that neuroscience piece where we have a, an emotional trigger that, that occurs and our amygdala doesn't know whether it's because we're really in danger or it's our 50th surprise birthday party. <laughs> and so mindfulness helps build the prefrontal cortex and buys us time to actually think about, because the amygdala doesn't think. The prefrontal cortex, one of the jobs is fear modulation, so we can see whether or not we're really in danger. And so it buys us a little more time so that we can stay at baseline if we're not, if there isn't an immediate threat, and, and even if there is, our prefrontal cortex is online, so we're able to choose how we're gonna respond next instead of our only choices be fight, flight, or freeze, you know. Right. So, wow. so that's a little bit about um, the takeaways and what I've learned yeah. um, and what I try to um, impart as some of the more important things about mindfulness and self-care that, that I want my participants to learn. It's very compelling. As, as you're speaking, I'm trying to be mindfully present and, mm -hmm. and also not think about how I sound on this podcast <laughs> or what I'm, um, so it's, it's, it's very compelling. And I wonder, you described some, um, some things that you have revised in your thinking about self-care mm -hmm. in terms of the end product for mm -hmm. the workshop mm -hmm. and uh, ways of, of looking at it mm -hmm. um, per individual group or individual person. Mm -hmm. Have you revised your thinking about self-care in any other ways? I have. And um, over the course of those 40 workshops and my own practice self-care, um, I've come to see self-care not as an activity, but as a mindset. So it's more s sort of like either a, a growth mindset where it's pervasive. And, um, you know, so, so that even though because um, we're not able to go to Hawaii or take a trip to Colorado to go skiing, um, and people think of that as self-care vacation, but there are little things that we can do all the time. Um, for instance, one of the things that I do for self-care, and I call it self-care in the background, I love old jazz. You know, to me it recalls my dad and growing up and 
So I have a Pandora station, and I might be working right before I came to NASP for, for two weeks. I was so busy that I, I had like three or four 12-hour days that I was just working nonstop. So I couldn't practice self-care in, in the ways that people normally think of it. But when I was working, I put on my Pandora Jazz, and every so often I'll stop and I'll listen, and it'll just really ground me and, and give me kind of press the reset button. Um, so, and, and I do that because I have become aware that that's something that I need to be doing, and I know um, what works for me. And so one of the things I ta also talk about is enduring self-care, which is self-care that, that actually is a result of changing your brain, and it usually involves a mindfulness component because mindfulness does um, thicken our prefrontal cortex and so it works even when we're not being deliberate about it um, but the other thing is is habits and habits initial initially require our prefrontal cortex energy but then once we get them going they move into our basal ganglia and don't require any cognitive load at all so things like that um, like when I wake up in the morning, I will, um, I had a hip replacement, and I'll do my hip exercises before I even get out of bed. Um, and that way I have, you know, it, it doesn't require, I don't have to look at my to-do list or anything like that. I just do it. And so I think that there, are, and when I get into my office, I turn on my diffuser with my essential oils, and I turn on my Pandora radio station, and I, I might not, you know, um, look up to breathe, although I try to take a break every hour and a half or so, but it still has me at baseline and grounded, even though I'm not able to maybe go for a walk, which is one of the things that I love to do um, mindfully um, all week because I'm so busy, but I still, there are still little things. I eat a square of 72% Trader Joe's Belgium dark chocolate every night, and that's another <laughs> healthy habit <laughs> that yes. I engage with. So there are things that we can do um, because as school psychologists, we're tremendously busy, um, but we can still take care to have a mindset that um, we need to be aware and we need to do things for ourselves that are going to be proactive and intentional and help us balance our work life um, loads and and have a quality of life so that we can stay in the profession and benefit children and families um, for longer than we might if we burned out you know crashed and burned and we're unable to um, have the longevity that we would like in your self uh, care practices that you've just described have you ever found that you need to slow down and recognize them mindfully? Do the, do the habits ever become sort of unmindfully? For example, I'm thinking of the chocolate. Mm -hmm. I also have that self-care <laughs> But I find that if I don't notice, if I'm just grabbing my mm. dark chocolate after lunch, or uh -huh. that it, it doesn't have the same positive effect. So that mindfulness component is really important. Right, right. And and my my... So when you develop habits, um, there are three components to a habit. The first is a trigger. Um, so my trigger with my chocolate is when I sit down to watch Rachel Maddow at night, because that's another one of my self-care, although sometimes it doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, so, so that's when I, and then I have one square. I allow myself one square, because that's also keto. And, um, and, it's, and it's high in um, flavonoids and antioxidants. Um, and, and so I've developed the habit. So, so there's the trigger, and that's after I sit down to watch Rachel Maddow. The behavior, which is one square, eating one square, and I usually eat it pretty mindfully. And then the reward is the delicious, mm -hmm. mindful, chocolatey goodness that I um, am able to enjoy. It's wonderful. So. Yeah, and um, that, I just want to say one other thing that I, that I do because I believe the benefits 
of mindful and infused self-care are so um, plentiful and and really worth um, being very intentional about. Um, one of the things that I do is I don't have time to sit on a mountain and cross-legged ohm. Um, so I will drive to work in a, a mindful state. So I'll bring my full attention to my drive, and I won't be thinking about the clothes in the dryer, or what I have to pick up on the way home, or who I'm meeting. I'll just be in the moment, just driving. A lot of what I do is focus on the, the negative space between the tree branches that you can really see now. And so I'll do that about 20 to 25 minute drive to work, and then the 20 to 25, or depending on when I leave, sometimes 35 minutes home. And I can just feel, especially going home, and, and going in, I can when I do that, when I when I I'm like I tell myself, okay, I'm gonna be mindful now, this is what I'm doing now, I can feel my body just relax. I can really feel the grounding mm-hmm. that I get when I connect to the moment. And and that's the reward for me then is is just that that peace and that relaxation in my muscles and the tension kind of leaves my body so so those are things and that doesn't I have to do that anyway I have to I have to go to work and and go home so anything really and that's one of the messages that I want to give my participants is anything that you do by bringing your full focused attention in the moment is mindfulness so I also like to and I'm not as successful but mindfully shower and I'll get, I'll splurge and get some homemade soaps, and I'll use that, and I'll feel the hot water, so it's a full sensory experience, and smell the soap, and then um, I'd also brush my teeth, and so I'll be tasting it, and and just feeling, you know, and then hearing the sound of the water, and so it's really a full mindfulness experience, sensor sensorially, and um, so, but I have to do it anyway, mm-hmm. you know. So folding clothes, working out in the gym, anything you can bring mindful attention to. Those are great examples. Would you, what would you suggest to a person who doesn't feel they have time to practice self-care? Okay. I, I think just what I said, that it doesn't take any time. And um, I certainly am someone who can become very busy um, in certain seasons of the school year. I'm extremely busy. Um, but I've kind of banished, I've also banished the O word from my, from my vocabulary, overwhelmed. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) I banished that from my vocabulary because, um, I also want to have, um, positive language and productive language. So I, I would just say, you know, create, um, positive, tiny habits, um, BJ Fogg from Stanford University has a website called Tiny Habits. And um, you can you can do that and just develop these habits that are, become automatic, um, but also just things like like I said, self care in the background. What brings you joy? You know, the color purple. I have you know purple accents in my office. You know, just things that you can do that will just sort of create that mindset. And that's what I mean about the mindset because we don't have time to go to Hawaii or go to, you know, Vail for for a ski vacation um, most of the times. Um, But we can do little things in our own um, space that are positive and and caring for ourselves. And a big thing is just really reframing to the positive. Some people are very self-critical or critical of other people, but they can change that mindset and that makes a huge difference in the way they care for themselves and others. Um, you know, the same with overcommitting. You know, I, I try to help people to identify chronic stressors, and and then there are just little things that you can do to to address those. And as long as you b- continue to be aware and intentional and proactive, um, it doesn't take a lot. And many of the things you have to do anyway. So it's a mindset. 
over committing and overwhelmed two words I will try to banish myself okay the double O's <laughs> yes <laughs> well thank you so much for your time and I hope that this conversation is helpful to many of us I, I know it was helpful to me as we think about self-care practices that can help us uh, be our best for the people that we work with and mm -hmm. care for mm -hmm. and also ourselves and also ourselves <laughs> That concludes this Dialogues podcast. Please tune in again for future Dialogue podcasts available on the NASP website.